Hello and welcome to Revenge of the Drive-In, the podcast where Jim and Patrick cover two movies randomly selected from a list of over 2,000. This podcast is brought to you by the Grandma Sophia's Podcast Network, and this week we are doing The Curse of Frankenstein, the 1957 Hammer Frankenstein film from director Terrence Fisher, and Ring, or Ringu, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the best title to refer to that. To refer to Let's that, just call but, it Ring. Let's just call it Ring. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, because I think Ringu is like a... It's made to sound Japanese, even though I think that's not a word in Japanese. I think that's the story. I think either Ringu is like an Americanized version of it, or yeah, a lot of Japanese right. words, or like in pop culture and just culture in general, when they use like an English word, sometimes they throw a U on the end of it to make it sound Japanese. Okay. So it could be their thing, but on a, something like Shudder, it's just called Ring. Yes, on Shudder, it's called Ring. And meanwhile, we have to introduce who the fuck you are. I am Patrick, <laughs> and this is my friend Jim. Hello, hello. More than a hundred years ago, in a mountain village in Switzerland, lived a man whose strange experiments with the dead have since become a legend. A legend that is still told with horror the world over. Curse of Frankenstein. This is a reuniting of the holy trinity of mid-century British horror, right? We've got director Terrence Fisher, Mm -hmm. we've got star Peter Cushing, and we've got... Christopher Lee playing a monster. We've seen it before. We've seen it many times before. We've seen it on this podcast before, of course, doing The Mummy. Yeah. Yeah, so let's just jump right into that, shall we? Just like the monster fallen from the house. <laughs> into the acid? The, the little pool. Was that acid? or Yeah, yeah I guess I it, was it was acid. acid. I, I mean, it just looks like water, but it has to be acid because they don't <laughs> find the body. So. so, The Curse of Frankenstein is like so many other films... Vaguely based on the Mary Shelley novel, you know, it's, it's actually kind of funny how, you know, for being such a famous novel and such an influential novel, and obviously there's been hundreds of Frankenstein movies, and none of them really accurately follow the novel. It's just kind of weird, but I also think it speaks to something about just the strength of the story itself, mm-hmm. that you can take it in so many different directions. Like, here, let's do the Frankenstein story... But let's make Dr. Frankenstein an utter psychopath. I like that. I like that take. And we've also got a a bit of a psychological angle to it, too, which I actually think is really interesting. And it's vaguely similar, I guess, to the novel, because the novel opens with some, like, polar explorer finding this crazy guy wandering in, in 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 the snow and ice. And he's Frankenstein, and he explains the story to him of what happened and obviously you know he's just he looks just like a crazy guy like we don't really and initially i should say you're really not supposed to know if you believe anything this guy says or not and that's Mm -hmm. kind of what this movie does except it opens very strangely with like titles you know some something that comes up and basically implying that this is a true story or something (laughs) you know it's it basically is like we all know this story and this is like what really happened I i don't remember exactly what it said but something along those lines, and it's like, okay, okay, we're we're starting right off with a lie. This is a, um, <laughs> this is the proto Fargo, right? Because Fargo yeah. starts yeah. out, you know, based on a true story or whatever. So, Baron Victor Frankenstein, Peter Cushing, is in prison awaiting execution, and he's visited by a priest. He makes it clear that he's not religious, but he feels he needs to tell his story to someone just anyone that will listen and initially the priest doesn't really want to listen but you know he wins him over eventually Mm -hmm. and then then it's through this frame narrative that we see the rest of the story play out we flash back to a young baron frankenstein after his uh mother dies he's all i mean his father's already dead so this is a young child although he kind of looks like a 25 year old trying to look like a child there's something yes, weird about yeah. weird looking about this actor it reminded me of my favorite holiday movie a christmas carol with alistair sim 
when he like goes back in time and they put him in like makeup and like younger clothes. Oh, and make okay. Him look I don't. Th- <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that. I didn't realize they. Great movie. Obviously they they have the young Scrooge, and I think most versions of that just have a different actor. But, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> we see kind of right away that this he's kind of an asshole even as a little kid. <laughs> Uh, but we also see, we also see that he's quite clever and quite curious because he hires a tutor named Paul, but he also has this interaction with his aunt, who um, she's going up to him again. This is right after his mother has passed, and she, she wants to talk to him about some allowance that his mother has been giving her, mm-hmm. and he promises to to still continue to give it to her so that she doesn't have to worry but at the same time he really like makes her feel vulnerable especially if he's if he's going to just settle the issue he kind of he basically makes her beg and um it's just kind of like it's interesting to see this coldness even in this kid but but it shows a few things one one that he's cold He's going to be a psychopath when he gets older, right? <laughs> and then also that he's surprisingly mature and intelligent for someone his age. And, and, of course, he has to be because he has been the Baron now for a long period of time. So he has this, you know, he has responsibilities as the man of the house and everything. But uh, I, I like that scene. That's, of course, he meets his cousin, Elizabeth, who eventually he has a relationship with but he basically doesn't see her for another i guess 20 years even though peter cushing looks 50 years older when we see him next um why do they have to pick a cousin to be a love interest because that's what it is in the novel actually that is one thing that's accurate to the novel (laughs) never mind okay i get it yeah this is i mean it was a different era in 1816 when that was written it was published in 1818 Then again, maybe it was. This is also the same year, 1957. Jerry Lee Lewis had a few hits this year. So, you know, the the cousin marriage was still alive and well in some parts of the world. <laughs> yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> so he hires Paul. Paul is played by, what's his name? It's something Urquhart or whatever, right? It's, it's the same last name as the guy in no the British clue. House of Cards. I think this guy kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's definitely no Peter Cushing. That's he's for no sure. Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing plays his roles, you know, incredibly well. But this guy is kind of just, he does this, like, he's angry a lot. And of course he is, because his person he has taught since he was a little child is a psychopath. But, like, he does a lot of this, like, Victor, what are you doing? But he just, like, <laughs> he doesn't, like, move his like face when he talks it's just weird he's he's doing this like i don't know it's just it's kind of a stiff performance and it's a shame because especially because peter cushing is so good so seeing them because a lot of this movie is just them arguing they they don't have a contentious relationship at this point in the movie but so much of this movie is just them yelling at each other (laughs) yeah and also isn't paul supposed to be you know like 20 years older yeah you you would think so but of course uh, because in the flashback yeah, we have a different actor playing Peter Cushing, and so, so we keep the same actor playing Paul. So, yeah, suddenly he looks younger than Peter Cushing almost, or about the same age at, at, at least. So, I also just want to point out, isn't it unfortunate that you have like a bunch of Star Wars fans who are like, oh, Peter Cushing, Star Wars, that's the greatest role ever. But in this movie, he's like, <laughs> he's actually acting, like he's fantastic. I think we talked about this in the Mummy episode, we are like... I compared him a bit to Alec Guinness because Alec Guinness has that thing where Star Wars fans are like, oh, yeah, Alec Guinness, yeah, he's Obi-Wan. And it's like, no, he's got shoe polish on his face. Like, it's <laughs> not, remember him for his Watch great Watch Bridge moments. on the River Kwai. Exactly. Bridge on the River Kwai is a fantastic movie. He's amazing in that. Phenomenal actor. Peter Cushing, not quite on the Alec Guinness level, but this is certainly his best role, at least of the films that I've seen. Not that Not that he's bad in Star Wars. He's fine as like a somewhat generic villain yeah in star wars but like here he's anything but generic exactly well also isn't it isn't it kind of funny that sir christopher lee count dooku yeah well i was gonna say that he's been knighted but i don't know in everything i've seen christopher lee in, like i like him he's a he's a fine actor but 
I think Peter Cushing was probably a little better, you know, and if <laughs> and if well, Christopher Lee was starring in these kind of hammer horror films and other kind of B movies throughout his life, it's it's interesting that he was knighted. Though I know he did like a lot of work on the stage too, right? It's complicated, right? Because the knighthood when it's given to actors or given to actors pop culture figures, it's supposed to be given not just for their on stage or in entertainment achievements, but it's supposed to have some relevance to their charity work right Mm. there was some controversy when Mick Jagger was knighted because people were saying he didn't do enough charity work and there's (laughs) (laughs) which is probably true technically Keith Richards who has not been knighted has done more charity work but that's because legally he had to otherwise he Canada was going to throw him in prison for like decades so he started (laughs) doing charity work with the blind in Toronto or whatever but um and then you have cases like Roger Moore Roger Moore was a legend but he was kind of just james bond right like can you really say yeah. he had that celebrated of a career it was kind of just one role i mean i know he did the saint but like who who the hell cares right <laughs> so um it's no james bond that's for sure exactly so so if we're if we're looking at someone for their for their whole career achievements i think christopher lee has a better career than peter cushing especially it goes on for so long and he's in lord of the rings you know that's decades true. later I was actually just the other day looking at something. This was, I mean, it was a Jeopardy rerun, but there was a, the final Jeopardy question was, in 1939, this actor became the third actor to be, to star in three films that, or the, the first actor to star in three films that won the Academy Award for Best Picture, and it listed the years as 34, 35, and 39. I knew right away it was Clark Gable, because, um... It happened one night, it was 34, Gone with the Wind is 39. I didn't know what the 35 one was, but it's like, okay, it's Clark Gable. And then I was looking up, okay, how many other actors have done that? You know, three. And I thought, like, okay, Talia Shire's in the, the two Godfather movies, and then also Rocky. And so I'm, like, looking at this, and Christopher Lee was in two films that won Best Picture. And they were oh. 60 fucking years apart. It was amazing. <laughs> I, I think he's, he's got to have the record for... Because wow. he's in... He's in um, <laughs> Well, actually, now that I think of it, I don't think he's in the theatrical version of Return of the King, is he? No, he's he, he's only in the extended. But they did list that, and I, I didn't think of that at the time. And then I think he's in, like, was it Lawrence of Arabia? Or, like, one of those really old movies. He probably has a small role in it. Oh, was he? Like, one of those, like, late 50s, you know. I, I think it's probably Lawrence of Arabia because it's a British movie. You know, I don't yeah. think it would be Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur's American. But... It's like wow, amazing. But then, then now, now that I'm bringing it up, I just thought like, oh, he's technically not in Return of the King or the theatrical version, but he's still in the Lord of the Rings. He's a major role yeah, in the first I, I two it. films, you know. Yeah, and he's in Star Wars. He's in the Willy Wonka remake. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> I think he's Willy Wonka's dad. Who like? Yeah, isn't he something like that? There's like some hackneyed backstory to Willy Wonka's character that we absolutely did not need. It's so much better just to see. Gene Wilder be this like unhinged weirdo that we don't know anything about, but <laughs> yeah, wicked, insane, evil. Call Frankenstein what you will. A demon had made a man-made monster, and now the monster was the master. Well, uh, you know, really, we should get back to the movie and talk about an unhinged weirdo we do know something about. Yeah, so they initially, this is years later. It's him and Paul. They have some success bringing a dog back from death, right? The, the, the dog's mm-hmm. dead. They bring it back, and they're like, oh, okay, awesome. This is going to work. And then Paul is like, oh, can we can we get this um, paper ready for this big scientific conference or whatever? Frankenstein's like, yeah, we could, but we're just not going to. We're going to, <laughs> we're going to continue <laughs> seeing what we can do with this. And this is where that relationship starts to get, to get contentious because – Frankenstein, he's brought something back from the dead. Now his, the next step in his eyes is to create life. And Paul isn't big on this. Paul is even less big on this once it turns to grave robbery and all this other stuff. (laughs) And eventually murder, which is awesome. Because they have this um, kindly old, like, Freud-type, like, German psychiatrist guy who's supposed to be, like, this genius. They invite him over. And then when Frankenstein is showing him up to bed, he just pushes him off the balcony <laughs> in his room. It's kind of like the omen. It's it's a similar scene to that. And the yeah. guy dies on impact. 
and it's awesome and i love how flimsy the balcony looks or the the railing i should say because it it looks like it's it, i mean it's just a couple steps up from cardboard but it's not something i mean it, it looks like a set right it well exactly look yeah I, I also i also love the dummy that they throw down over it like it looks so uh real <laughs> You know, I, like it does the way it lands and the way the body's just. Are you certain it is a dummy? I mean, I I, cause I don't. I'm not sure. This. I thought it. it I thought I mean, it, it could was be a dummy. stunt. Okay, but, I would I would have to see it again. Yeah. But either way, it's it's that's that's a great scene. It's kind of gross. You know, like it makes you feel kind of gross actually, and you're like, ugh. <laughs> and at this point, of course, Elizabeth has come back into the picture. She's going to be married to Frankenstein, but. Frankenstein has literally never mentioned her to Paul, so Paul's just kind of like, what, what's going on here? Then there's a there's a really awesome transition here where it's Elizabeth talking to Paul, and she's talking about how they're going to be married, and then they immediately just cut to Frankenstein making out with one of his maids, and <laughs> yeah, it's it it really like it's again this Frankenstein being this villain. He's a villain on every level. He's a scumbag. Not just because he murders kindly old Freudian psychologists, but he, you know, he's 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 a scumbag. He he's he lies yeah. to Elizabeth. He lies to this poor maid who's actually pregnant. Yeah, and th- then he essentially calls her a slut too. He's like, "Get out of here! Yeah. Go up to any guy in the town. I'm sure it's one of theirs." <laughs> it's like, okay. Only two women ever entered this house of evil. Elizabeth, come back! Elizabeth. The lovely cousin who had promised to marry him, and Justine the maid who kept passionate and secret rendezvous with her master. Uh, all the other Frankenstein movies that we've done for this podcast, you have Frankenstein and the monster. Here we have Frankenstein actively being the monster. Yes, and that's the the irony of this movie, and maybe of the series as a whole. I think there's one or two movies in this Hammer Frankenstein series that I haven't seen, um, and it's been a long time since I've seen most of them. But the irony is the monster stuff isn't very good. Yeah. Because we eventually get Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee, a fine actor, but <laughs> kind of like in The Mummy, this just isn't the right role for him. He's better no. when he when he's talking and he's better when you can... You know, because well, in the Dracula movies, he's, he's an incredible Dracula. He barely talks in most of those movies, but he just has this, like, presence about him that's completely different than it is here. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a big guy, he's an opposing figure, but then he's got the makeup that doesn't look great, too. Yeah, and, and, and just the way he's moving, like, I, I appreciate him putting in the effort to make it look like a, a, he's a reanimated corpse, but it just looks feeble most of the time, you know? It, it's it's not tall and intimidating, it's just tall and feeble. Yeah, I think that's fair. And then also, you know, going back to, we've only covered one other Frankenstein movie for the podcast, and of course it is the Boris Karloff Frankenstein but how imposing really is this monster? He kills a blind guy. I'm sorry, <laughs> I could do that. He's blind. He's an old blind guy on top of that. I guess he kills yeah. the... A kid. Do you, you, don't, you don't see the kid get killed, right? But I no. think they find his little... They find his fishing pole or something. Like yeah, they, 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 they find his little bag killed. or whatever. And then he kills a pregnant woman who can't run away from him because she's eight months pregnant um, yeah and, just and because she's, she's not been... showing but because uh-huh. <laughs> she's been locked inside of a room with him yeah exactly he it's it, it's his doing it's it's frankenstein's doing yeah he's just not the most threatening monster but of course the movie's not really about him the movie is about how this obsession of frankenstein has gotten out of hand and how you know he'll stop at nothing to accomplish his goals like why does he want his like does he just want to be seen as brilliant and a genius probably he's that egotistical yeah but there really is like a um i know you haven't seen it because i mentioned it a few times jim and i know but like he he, there's like a walter white quality where he's just like so freaking ruthless like there's a brian cranston in breaking bad type thing and and that's i just think that's interesting because that's usually not how we associate this the frankenstein the scientist character and then also be quite frank we don't associate the 1950s with great 
intimidating psychopath acting like that seems like a more modern yeah. thing i mean we have we have anthony perkins and psycho in 1960 but for the most part like the really like intense complex villain performances we just you don't see because there's like a stiffness to a lot of like the older acting you know like what i was talking about with paul like he's you know imagine the those those two roles reverse paul would be terrible you know oh, yeah abs- <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, maybe Christopher Lee could have done this role. I, Peter Cushing could not have played the monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We've only just started. Just opened the door. Look, now's the time to go through that door and find what lies beyond it. But don't you see, Paul? We've discovered the source of life itself, and we've used it to restore a creature that was dead. This is Frankenstein, who revolted against nature, who experimented with the devil and was forever cursed. A lot of the movie at this point is Paul trying to get Elizabeth to leave the house because she's not safe. But at the same time, he never tells her why. And it, he, he implies that it's something to do with the scientific experiments. But she has no idea what he's doing. And she keeps saying, like, oh, one of these days he'll let me into his laboratory and stuff. And it's like, okay, no. Wouldn't you understand you're in real danger? What Victor is doing is dangerous to everyone in the house. Ah. <gasps> cannot possibly conceive what dreadful thing he's planning to do. What are you trying to tell me, Paul? That Victor's wicked? Insane? So so the, the, the movie does get a little repetitive kind of in the middle, but of course, at one point, this is when the monster is first created, when the monster first comes to life, he nearly kills Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. He's, he's choking him, but then Paul stops him. And then the monster gets away, and this is when he kills the blind man and his grandchild. Then the two scientists confront the monster, and Paul shoots him, and he actually kills them. It's it's amazing. This yeah. is the, the shortest monster on the loose in the history of Frankenstein films. <laughs> also, I want to point out, too, in this scene, if you haven't already thought by this point that Frankenstein's a real dick, Paul's telling him, he's like, hey, get the nearby village to help. we got to find him. Also, he might be killing people in the woods. When they shoot him dead, Paul's like, okay, quickly, let's bury the body before the villagers find him. And He's Frank like, oh, goes, I didn't ah. call anyone. He goes, yeah, I didn't call anybody. Don't worry about it. It's like, <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> the monster's dead again, but Frankenstein's just going to bring him back, of course. And, and that's that's what he does. At this point, Paul has left. He, Paul is out of the picture because he doesn't want to deal with this anymore. And Elizabeth won't listen to him when he's telling Elizabeth to leave. So he returns actually for their wedding. Technically, he misses the wedding, but he shows up later. Or no, he misses the rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah, we have that very brief scene of the drunk guy practicing his toast. (laughs) I was so behind that drunk guy when I saw him. Paul arrives and then is surprised to see that the monster is back and alive. The monster's got a partially shaved head because he's done... He's done some brain work on him, but so not only is is Frankenstein a psychopath, a murderer, he's also like a master manipulator. There's all this yes. about like, you know, Paul, you're in this as deep as I am, you know, you can't go to the authorities. He's he's guilting Paul because he says the only reason the monster is a monster is because when we argued you damaged the brain at one point, and it's like that might be true. We don't know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I can't prove you murdered, but I can stop you using his brain. Why? He has no further use for it. Don't be a fool! Be careful! You damage it! The monster's back. He kills the, his maid. Frankenstein locks his pregnant maid into Frank the, the monster's living quarters, and he gets and she gets killed. So the monster frees himself. And he's trying to capture Elizabeth. Elizabeth is, like, outside, like, up top in, like, this balcony. Or, like, like outside in the balcony. It's not, not the same balcony that we murdered the Freud guy on. But I actually <laughs> think this is a little weird just because we haven't seen this location before. And this is the climax. And you, you don't, we don't really see a lot of exteriors. No. And, and, again, this whole scene here is weird because you have elizabeth who's just wandering around and then you have the monster who's also wandering around they look like they're on a like a rooftop right so the monster 
attacks her. She screams. Victor grabs his gun. Paul's outside. Victor runs inside, grabs his gun, finds Elizabeth, says, hey, come on down. Let's let's go back inside. And then the monster shows up behind her. Yeah. So he takes two shots at the monster. The first one, it looks like it hits Elizabeth, but it doesn't. Oh, yeah, that was that's right. Yeah, she like faints when it happens right yeah yeah and you're and i'm like oh my god did he shoot her no yeah and i really thought because again going back to the frame narrative he's in prison yeah i yeah. thought maybe oh did he accidentally kill his fiance and then it's you know he's being convicted of murder like that's what it kind of seems like for a second yeah exactly but then um the monster starts walking towards him he shoots him again and doesn't stop him he throws the gun at him and then he picks up an oil lamp and yeah. whips it at uh, at the monster, which right. lights him on so, fire. Yeah, so he's on fire, and then he tumbles to his his death inside in the acid uh, in the acid tub. Which fortunately, that was just lying around on the inside. <laughs> Mad scientist, <laughs> yeah, it, man. It was man, right under the under window. Acid. Then we cut back to the present day. Frankenstein back in the in the in the prison. The priest obviously doesn't believe him. Which, by the way, I want to point out how roomy this prison room is. They're treating oh, yeah, this guy huge. well. This is this is the um, Swiss equivalent, you know, an early 19th century Swiss equivalent of, like, a white-collar prison, probably, it's, right? It's the Baron suite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, like, this, it's it's bigger than my apartment, you know? It's, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big, it's a big room. A lot of, yeah. lot of space to move around here. And then Frankenstein has a visitor, and it's Paul. And he's like, oh, thank God, Paul will be able to verify everything. And then Paul, of course, gets there, claims he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, the, the what creature, what are you talking about? And this is when it's revealed that he's in prison for murdering the maid. I don't think we had established that that was why he was in prison yet. Oh, I didn't even know that that's why. I thought it was... Well, thanks for watching the movie. <laughs> and then Paul leaves. <laughs> and as he's leaving, he he goes and, and he's he's with Elizabeth out there in the little waiting room lobby area and he's like oh there's nothing we can do now and then so the two of them leave and then we see frankenstein being walked down the hallway to the guillotine which we see being raised like over you know in a neat shot as the credits start rolling yeah i i like that shot a lot the ending's really neat again going back to the psychological element to the film which obviously it's a Frankenstein movie. We it's it's hard to get fully on board with like this is all in his head kind of thing. You know, I, I don't think it quite works as like a Fight Club or a American Psycho type thing, but it's still an interesting direction to go. But mm-hmm. then we see Paul at the end, and it's like, okay, was Paul lying about this just to get with Elizabeth? Like that that's almost that's, you could read into it that way. You could read into it. Frankenstein is crazy you could read into it that Paul knows damn well what happened but he thinks Frankenstein's a menace and if he's let out of prison it's just more people are going to die and he's going to do yeah that's what I shit. assumed yeah I think that's probably the most likely but I think there are a multitude of reasons and just him being with Elizabeth there at the end it's like okay is he being a good friend and just helping Elizabeth you know cope with her fiance is in prison for murdering his mistress or is he you know trying to slide into those dms you know it's it's a couple (laughs) couple options which i think is interesting especially because going back to the 1931 frankenstein whether intentional or not there's like a little bit of like a potential love triangle there with like i don't remember the character name but um frankenstein's old buddy is like he has a lot of chemistry with that with that fiance character as well Mm -hmm. and that's that's on display really from the beginning from when we meet that character we're here we don't see it until the end but it's it i don't know it's interesting it's an interesting ending and i think overall i'm not a huge fan of like the frame narrative in movies because i think usually it's just like okay you know, it's just I just don't see them as all that necessary for the most part, and it's like it's a way to potentially eliminate a lot of suspense. Not that yeah. there would be that yeah. much suspense because we've seen this story so much, but at the same time, with with how this ends, that actually, it, like I think it kind of recontextualizes a lot of what we saw in the flashbacks. So I actually like this frame narrative. You know, it, mm-hmm. overall, I don't happen to like this kind of filmmaking. 
or storytelling technique all that much, but I think it really works here. Yeah, I agree. It does kind of take some air out of the balloon when you realize, oh, this is all a, a flashback. But at the end where Paul does kind of screw him over and send him to the to the guillotine. I or does that was he? Is he just it. telling the truth? I think that like, yeah, exactly. I, I'm, there is that psychological element. I mean, we can say this movie has sequels and, uh, you know, the next movie... And he just survives the guillotine. I don't remember if they really explain it. So it's like, okay, eventually we see Frankenstein d- continuing to do his thing. But if this movie just existed by itself, there is a way to read that kind of he's just... Because we see he's crazy. Frankenstein is crazy. Now, whether yeah. the the craziness only manifests in ambition or it manifests in complete and total delusion where he can convince himself he's done all these things... It is, in, and again, going back to the novel, I think there's, as different as this movie is from the novel, there is that element in the novel. A, it's it's a frame story, the, the, the original Frankenstein Mary Shelley novel. It is a frame story. But then also how we meet that character, we're supposed to, like, is he, is he a crazy weird? Like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. So I, I like that. But Jim, what do you think of The Curse of Frankenstein? Uh, I thought it was a fine movie. Yeah, it was fine. I really liked the angle of, of, again, I mentioned it earlier, of Dr. Frankenstein actually being the monster, the biggest monster in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really have much else to say about it. It was, it was a fine movie. Yeah, it, it's a story we've we've heard a million times, but uh, they had a nice little twist on it. Yeah. How about you? I like it quite a bit. It sounds like I probably enjoyed it more than you. I do think the Peter Cushing performance is just incredible. Like, not just for a horror movie not just for peter cushing but this is just a great leading performance you know no matter the genre no matter the time period i think this just works he definitely stole it all that's for sure just like he robbed those graves (laughs) and and then you know so so (laughs) because i mentioned the guy playing paul who i might as well get his full name here let me yeah robert urk urkhart urk Urk urkwahart um scottish character actor yeah he sucks in this movie i'm sorry paul paul kremp his unwilling collaborator was paul kremp paul kremp more like paul crap am i right yeah <laughs> i do think the, the the i know i said this earlier but the monster stuff you know the, the literal monster the creature yeah. is is the worst stuff about this movie and that's not not really a knock against christopher lee i don't think this is the right role for him but i think christopher lee works really well when you can see his face and his facial expressions, and and where he is speaking. <laughs> Plain yeah, because because the only the only two movies we've seen him in it's this and the Mummy. The Mummy, he's like you don't see his face. He's he's got the full makeup thing. I remember we complained about it. you see way too much of his eyes <laughs> because there's something about the oh, costume. They yeah. just like left too big of eye holes in there. It's like <laughs> yeah. Halloween H two O, but here. <laughs> You see more of his face, even though it is under makeup. You can tell it's Christopher Lee if if you've seen a young-ish Christopher Lee in something. But I don't want to say he's not playing a character, but he's not playing a human. And, it, you know, it, it hurts. I don't want to compare this to Boris Karloff and to the 1931 Frankenstein because I think they're very different movies for the most part. But Boris Karloff was wholly convincing as this new life who's like trying to figure out how to work in his own body and stuff like that for sure like like a like a grown toddler basically like a seven foot toddler basically how (laughs) boris karloff plays that and going back to like how he gets excited playing the little girl and then he kills her this monster he's more you know i i I don't want to use the word evil but he's more immediately threatening than the boris karloff character the boris karloff monster has to be tortured by fritz and whipped around yeah. this guy i mean the first thing he does is try and choke peter cushing which in this movie that's actually a good thing so you know we should be, <laughs> we should be rooting for him in that instance but then when, when he's wandering out in the woods and the old man like i guess he kind of feels threatened by the old man even though we know there's no real reason for him to feel threatened but he's just yeah. a little scared and 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 that's the that's that's the equivalent of if there is an equivalent, that's the equivalent of the thr- drowning the little girl scene in the 1931 film. And it's just not as effective. No. and it, It just isn't, you know. 
Kind of like what you said, Karloff's monster was kind of like a toddler learning about the world around them. And and, and you, you had that kind of sweet scene between the girl with the flowers and, and the monster. Yeah. This, you he's just fucking like walking through the woods and killing people left and right. <laughs> You know, like, like it. I... The monster stuff is the is the worst stuff in this movie. And as much as I love when children get murdered in movies, we, we <laughs> mentioned that before. It's just not the most compelling. I mean, first of all, we don't even see the kid get killed. That's a missed no, opportunity. no. Well, we don't actually see anybody get killed, other than the monster, twice. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, they do the tasteful cutaways when. Um, the the maid gets locked in, which was they they cut away specifically to show that Frankenstein is locking the door behind her, which is which is a neat thing to do. One thing I did like about this movie was the uh, laboratory set, how it was kind of crazy and like there was just kind of stuff everywhere. But I liked the machine. I liked the I liked the tank that was full of water. Yeah, I liked how they had lightning. <laughs> strike and restart the machine when Peter Cushing was upstairs arguing with Paul. That's right, yeah, because initially he um, he's like, Paul, I need your help because I can't get the, you know, only you know how to make this machine work. And then Paul's like, okay, that's good. That means the machine will never work because I don't want you making this life. But then lightning. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like God is on Frankenstein's side there. I also like the whole bit about the brain, you know, how they took the brain out of the professor. But in the fight, <laughs> the jar that it's in is thrown against the wall by Peter Cushing, and it impales the brain with glass. And that's mm-hmm. why Frankenstein, or the, that's why the monster's so fucked up. <laughs> like it wasn't like accidentally a criminal brain, you know. The brain itself is amazing. This is one hell of a prop. This is 1957. This is like the most gruesome thing ever in a 50s mm-hmm. movie, basically, right? Oh, for sure. For its time, it was really, really nasty. This got reviews from, like, the British press as, like, people were saying it's just the most fucking disgusting thing. (laughs) This was the hostel of its day, which is funny because now we think of it as it's this classy gothic horror movie. But no, when it came out, this was, like, extreme. And, like, I, I saw a poster of this movie that's, like, declaring it as, like, the most disgusting horrific thing ever and it's like okay you know you can kind of see that but it's just kind of interesting to see how times have changed you know yeah we have far gorier stuff than this on basic cable you know nowadays so it's just kind of interesting but it's just worth pointing out because this movie was very controversial when it came out just like i mean the original the 1931 james whale frankenstein was controversial Mm and when that came out for being pretty shocking grave robbery and then also some of the dialogue with the you know, now I know what it feels like to be God, which was a line that was actually censored. Yeah, I mean, there's a long history of Frankenstein pushing boundaries, I guess, in, in terms of what is considered good taste. So I respect that. Well, should we move on from one movie based on a novel to another movie based on a novel? Sure, I've read this novel, kind of. Have you really? Like a long time ago. I read it, either part of it or all of it. I know there's... um. So years ago, high school, freshman year of high school, we had this project thing where we had to compile an anthology. We would include, like, passages from a bunch of different works, and we had to, like, there were certain criteria we had to include for, like, authors from different places. We needed authors from the state of Wisconsin. We needed authors from Europe. We needed, like, whatever. And and I, we also had to keep some kind of theme, and so I went, like, horror and science fiction. And I'm like, well, fuck, how do I find an Asian author? And then I'm like, I'm looking up, like, okay, I know there's, like, a lot of Japanese horror movies. And it's like, oh, The Ring's based on a novel? It's like, okay, I'll throw that in there. So I, I don't really remember if I read it, but I at least included it in a little anthology thing that I did. And I think I got a C on because I didn't listen to some of the directions. <laughs> well, you know, A for effort, Patrick. That's, that's what I give you, A for effort. Yeah, so Ring... 1998, based on a 91 novel by Koji Suzuki. I believe it's directed by Hideo Nakata, or right. Nakata, probably, is how you probably pronounce it. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the stars' names here, just because I love Japanese names so much. Okay. I know who one of these guys is. I've seen him in other things. The the, the ex-husband. I've seen yeah, him yeah. in a few things. Okay. He was, he was in the recent Mortal Kombat movie. I think I've seen him in, like, Takashi Miike movies or something because I, I, I'm i confused because someone in 
the Mortal Kombat movie was in Itchy the Killer. And I don't think that's this guy, but I think he's in other movies I've seen. Nanako Matsushima, who I believe is, I'm going to butcher her name, but it's, uh, I believe she plays Raiko, Raiko, Raiko Asakawa, the journalist. Are you waiting for me to correct you? Because I'm, I'm okay with that. Just okay, let's, yeah, let's go with that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> then we have, uh, oh man, uh, we have Miki Nakatani and Hiroyuki Sanada. Yeah, Sanada, Hiroyuki Sanada is, I'm looking him up, I'm, it, I don't see a Takashi Miike movie here, but this guy has been in a bunch of Hollywood movies for a Japanese actor. He's probably one, other than Ken Watanabe, is probably like the most accomplished like Japanese actor in terms of Hollywood movies. He's Oscar nominated and stuff, but this guy oh, really? is in Rush Hour 3. Um, he's in Speed Racer. He's in, oh. which I have not seen. <laughs> he's in The Wolverine, which was the x-men movie with wolverine doing his thing in japan so he's probably a major role in that he might not be i don't know he's in 47 ronin which is the infamous movie flop film Um, yeah it was a cool movie though yeah maybe it was but it didn't do well it was like a major box office disaster he's also in the last samurai speaking of ken watanabe so he's done some he's also in avengers endgame what the fuck who is he in that (laughs) what (laughs) He's in Minions? Dude, dude, this dude's in everything. Dude, the guy's all over the place. He's in Army of the Dead, the Zack Snyder film. He's in Bullet Train, which, when we're recording this, is in theaters right now. He's also in John Wick Chapter 4 coming up soon. Oh, so, my yeah, God. good for this guy. You think we could get him on our podcast? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Because we're not even 100% sure how to pronounce his name. I think that's usually yeah. a good start. We start off on September 5th, so throughout the movie we get dates because, you know, everybody knows the story of Ring, uh, because Ring was kind of like a big pop culture phenomenon when the American remake was released in the early 2000s, I guess. Would you say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I, I you know, the, the American remake is certainly in America better known than this movie, but this movie is, the, the Japanese original is still relatively well known. It's, it's well known as far as is as well known as like foreign horror movies can yeah. be well known right to yeah. american audiences and i think most people who see both of these movies think highly of both of them you know this in the american remake like i don't think there's really a consensus as to which is better and i think some as someone who's seen them both and i've never seen them you know i would almost need to see them like back to back because each time i see one of them because this is the second time I saw this movie, and it's like, I haven't seen The American Ring in a few years, so it's like, I don't remember it well enough to know which is better, but I think they're probably pretty similar, because they're both good movies. They're both solid. Yeah, solid I, I remember movies. I remember The American Ring being a little creepier, but I also, I haven't seen it in like 10 years. I remember being, or feeling more disturbed by the video. Yes, the, vi- the, the video is different, and I wanted to draw attention to that, because this is, you know, talk about feeling like an idiot, so... This movie, <laughs> I remember, you know, when I watched this, I'm like, wait a second, there was no ring. Because in The oh. Ring, the American, the 2002 movie, which for the sake of clarity, that is The Ring, this is Ring. We'll just we'll just go with that. The mm-hmm. Naomi Watts film. They, they watched the little experimental video and stuff. And there's like a ring, uh, the ring of light in on the black screen, right? Which is, you yeah. find out is the well or whatever. But that is the titular ring. And then I'm like, wait wait a second, there was no ring in this movie. But no, the ring is, it's is the, the phone one? ringing. Yeah, oh, I felt oh. like a complete... You didn't know either. Okay, no, so we're both I, I, I just assumed. I just also assumed it was just the, 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 the well, but you're right. Yeah, it's it's the... Which, first of all, that makes, that makes me feel dumb, but then it also makes me think, like, American movies are kind of dumb, too, because they, they had to make the ring literal <laughs> and not, not that not that a phone <laughs> ringing is metaphorical but but they that, yeah. that they had to they wanted to keep the title so it's like we need to actually visualize a ring which is just kind of interesting you know <laughs> yeah well clearly i didn't get it holy I, I, I can't believe that wow yeah i didn't get it someone pointed it out to me when when someone who's never even seen this movie i was talking to her about it and i'm like yeah it's weird that the, there's no actual ring in this and she's like oh but what about the phone and i'm like oh my god you're right <laughs> <laughs> Someone who hasn't even seen the movie was able to <laughs> figure shit. out the, what the title meant easier than me. Oh, uh, man. I like that. Yeah, but what about the phone? 
Yeah. God, we're dumb. Well, speaking of phones ringing then, the movie opens the date is September 5th, a week the ago. The day after Beyonce's birthday. There's these two high school age girls hanging out. They're having a sleepover at Tomoko's house. And Masami, I assume is the, I think that's the name of the other girl. She's telling her friend Tomoko about this scary story with, uh, you know, with a... a <laughs> a t- the urban you know, legend this is an urban yeah, legend a fictional exactly. urban legend also i was just uh, i just had a brain fart because i was i was giggling to myself maybe for anybody who's like younger and who's listening to this podcast we used to have these things called vcrs phones. oh <laughs> yeah and phones. sure sure yeah that took well you yeah we used to have home phones we don't have those anymore those are yeah, as outdated yeah, right. as vcrs yeah, you had a VCR, and you used to put a tape, a VHS, into the tape, and that's how you used to watch movies before DVDs. So her friend is telling her this story, this urban legend that she's heard. And uh, pretty quickly, Tomoko gets pretty disturbed. And and her friend's like, yeah, are you okay? She goes, well, that happened to me a week ago, exactly a week ago. And she's like, oh, my God. She goes, yeah, and there was a voice. They called us, and you'll die in seven days, and or you've got seven days left to live or whatever. And yeah, They're like, well, that's crazy. Well, as soon as they finish the story, the home phone downstairs ring. The girls are terrified of answering it, but it turns out it was just Tomoko's mother saying she's going to Yeah, it's a little fake out first. Tomoko's friend excuses herself, goes to the bathroom, and as she's in the bathroom, the TV turns on. And Tomoko walks over, turns it off, and then we hear kind of like a like a tapping, crawling, creepy noise. And Tomoko turns and looks at the camera and then just kind of like dies <laughs> she dies yeah and now uh, a few things one this is an outstanding opening scene but i don't think when i think of like great opening scenes i don't usually think of this and i think that's for a few reasons one is i've basically seen this opening scene th- in three different movies because this scene i mean the, the entire movie the 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 ring the Naomi Watts movie is very similar to this movie. It's not mm-hmm. it's not a shot for shot remake. It's not Gus Van Sant's Psycho, but it's closer to that than it is to Luca whatever Luca Doncic's uh, Suspiria. Because that's an example of a remake that's so different from the original. You know, it might keep a theme or two, but yeah. you know, and the overall story is similar, but the movie itself couldn't be more different. This movie or the the American remake of this is very very similar. And then also the Scary Movie 3, which is <laughs> playing off of the American remake. But the opening scene is it's the exact same thing. They just throw jokes into it. And it, I think it's Pamela Anderson and Jenny McCarthy in that one. That was kind of scary. I know something even scarier. <gasps> what? Have you heard about this videotape? The one where they do it on the boat? And then in the car? And then in the bathtub? And he's like, hey, baby, I love you. And she's like, where are we? And did you see this? No, not that tape. So I've basically, this is an outstanding opening scene but it's almost like it already feels like a cliche to me because i've just seen it in other things but it it really is a great suspenseful way to open the movie this is one hell of a fictional urban legend an urban legend created for well in this case for the novel but you know it created in the fictional universe of this film well and also this opening scene does such a great job of just (laughs) like explaining the stakes and explaining what's happening yeah, you know, seven and days. you're just glued to the edge of your seat because you're like, oh my god, this crazy urban legend, this girl's just lived it. Oh, but it's okay, it's a joke. <laughs> then it happens, you know. And then the seven days thing, which is important because it establishes that she watched the video six days before Beyonce's birthday, um, which is <laughs> important. Shut up. <laughs> Come on, everyone knows her birthday is September 4th. Everyone I'm, knows that. It's the next day, or at least a couple days later, and we are introduced to... Reiko Asakawa. She's a journalist. When we're introduced to her, she's interviewing these three schoolgirls, and she's asking them mm-hmm. if they've ever heard of the of the tape story. And uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we heard it. Oh, yeah, it's from Izu, somewhere in, from south of Japan. That's where we heard people went and saw it. Yeah, that that's an important thing to note, that this is kind of, you know, it kind of others, like, the people that created this urban legend or whatever, right? Because the movie, yeah. uh, take does it, do they ever say it takes place in Tokyo? No, but I assume it. Yeah, does. I, I mean, it's an it's an urban area wherever she, wherever she is, right? It, whether it's Tokyo, but it kind of like this this whole urban legend thing. It's like, oh yeah, we've heard of that. That's not from here. That's from these like weird, um, people down hill south. people. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> yeah. like which I think is something kind of 
interesting, and I think there could be some social angles there that the movie's exploring that maybe don't really translate, being a Japanese movie and being watched yeah. by some North American losers who have a podcast. But there's, <laughs> but I do think there's something okay, kind of okay. like. <laughs> kind of like accurate about that like when we hear about these like weird things like oh we don't believe that that's just like these weird spiritual people buy that stuff but like no we're sophisticated we live in a city well one of the girls at the table says she believes in it because a friend of hers had two friends that died in a car mysteriously after they seven days after they watched the tape Mm -hmm. reiko she heads back to the office before she's leaving she flips through the paper and sees that indeed they're there was two teenagers found dead in a car under mysterious circumstances. One of, one of the best scenes is when she finds the, the police video or whatever. Oh, of, yeah, of it's that great. La- that, that's way later, but that's so creepy and disturbing. It turns out that this journalist is the aunt of Tomoko, the girl who was killed in the beginning of the of the movie. Right. So her and her young son head to the funeral at, the, at her house. She's sort of putting together some clues as to what happened to her niece. There's a closed casket. And, like, a family member or a friend says, like, isn't it weird that, that, that there's a closed casket? We, we don't even know how she died. Apparently right. she was just found dead. Wait up, man. I heard Jamal from 90th Street. He watched that tape last week. And this morning he woke up dead. <gasps> how the hell do you wake up dead? Because you're alive when you go to sleep. Wait, just tell me you can So you're telling me. me that you can go to bed dead and wake up alive? You can't go to bed dead, man. That shit would be redundant. Just tell me No, who? it wouldn't. Because you can go to bed and not be dead, and you can die but not be in a bed. But you are in a bed, man. That's how you wake up dead in the first place, fool. On her way out of the house, she runs into some schoolgirls who went to the same school who said that yeah like our other friends who also watched this video died today as well Mm -hmm. or yesterday or whenever it was this is when we get this awesome video that we see reiko is shown this video from an assistant of hers and it's just like the, the, the cops are pulling the body out of the car and they just freeze frame on like this awful, the like, expression tortured, on the face, twisted yeah. expression. Yeah, like it, it, it's like an expression of pure fear. Yeah, it's it's not it's not the face that a dead body would have if the di- if the person died suddenly or something like that. There's something yeah. more nefarious going on. Apparently. Yeah, and they mention that their hearts stopped. They're like, well, well, was there any injuries? They're like, no, their hearts just stopped. Now, I don't know how you feel about this scene that I'm about to touch on, but Reiko heads back to uh, her sister's house to chat with her sister about the death of her daughter. It seems like there's like a bit of supernatural work at play because when Reiko walks into her niece's room, like a gust of wind kind of like flips open a receipt for a a film development place. Well, that's the thing is is that this movie obviously is a supernatural horror movie because the tape is some kind of supernatural thing, but that's... The characters, like the main characters are like supernatural, right? Because we've got like a psychic and which we haven't gotten to that yet. Again, it's been a long time since I've seen the Naomi Watts movie. I'm assuming that's not in there. I think that's probably just in the Japanese version that they kind of streamlined the story a bit more in the American version. But that's kind of interesting. It took me a while to get used to maybe just because I was like, um, I don't know, maybe because the last time I saw a ring movie, it was the naomi watts one so i'm just like oh this is weird i wasn't expecting this but you know yeah i, I guess i've got some issue i i like the way they depict that that's that's what the hiroyuki sonata character mainly but i like how they depict it actually there's that scene where he's just like sitting on the bench and there's like a creepy ghost lady just like kind yes. of looking at him like that scene is yeah it's ultimately fantastic. kind of pointless but it's really awesome and creepy yeah, so, so to get closer to, to introducing the psychic, Reiko gets the film developed. She's flipping through the photos. She sees that they were all taken before her niece was killed. And the last photo in the set is her niece and all of her friends standing in front of a cabin in Isu. And all their faces are, like, warped on the film. Yeah. So she goes down to Izu, she goes into the same cabin, she stays there. So she, she goes up to the front desk and realizes that he has, like, a shelf of movies. At which I thought at first were, like, dirty movies, but... Then there's like one black spine <laughs> film at the back. She goes, I want that one. What's that? Tell the crew to push the whopper button. He goes, oh, somebody must have left it here. Gives it to Reiko. Yeah. She goes back to her cabin and watches it. And sure enough, it is the film. The spooky yes. film. We got, we got to talk about the spooky film. First of all, yeah. 
this is one of the biggest strengths of this movie and and even of the american remake because this that's i think it's a longer video in that one Mm -hmm. but in terms of how creepy this movie is but it also feels like it feels otherworldly it feels supernatural but it also feels like a cheap student film you know it feels like it could have been created by a person but that the person was either just (laughs) artistically kind of directionless or just or or just a psychopath but yeah so what's what's all the stuff that happens in the the tape there's that word floating around yeah well i think if it first opens with somebody crawling out of a well then it cuts to i think a screen full of words and the big word that that was translated is eruption yeah yeah it's it's presumably i think it's the same word just oh okay swirling around but i'm not 100 percent sure because they only translated one word in the subtitles so and then there's footage of like people crawling along the ground, but some people are crawling backwards, some are crawling forwards, which is kind of spooky. And then there's, oh, there's a shot of like a, a woman in the mirror brushing her hair. Yeah. And then that cutting to another mirror with a woman in white standing there and cutting back and forth. There's a shot of what appears to be a man with like a white sheet over his head pointing at something. I think it ends with an eyeball flashing at the screen, but in the eye it says Sada, S-A-D-A. Right. And then I think the film ends. Yeah, it, 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 you're right. It is like this really spooky kind of otherworldly thing. Yeah, because there is a weird, like, wannabe, pretentious artist quality to any kind of, like, bad student film that, like, what works about some of those movies or, like, the mildly interesting things about them kind of pass as, like, this weird supernatural thing in this movie. But it being ultimately kind of a pretentious art house film kind of thing also kind of make it pass as like yeah this is made just by a weirdo and and i guess that's you know it makes sense that characters watch that and they might be disturbed by it or they might just think oh that's kind of stupid and and think nothing of it until they get that phone call like it, it kind of it passes for a few different things yeah exactly well and speaking of phone call after the the video's over well, she sees the reflection in the exactly. television first, yeah. Exactly. Then the phone rings. Well, she turns to see, to, to look at the person, but nobody's there. Then the phone rings. She's got one week left. Be- before the film is due back, or? Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Late fee, man. So she heads back to Tokyo, presumably. And uh, the next day, she calls her psychic ex-husband. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna, and I'm going to butcher this name. Ryuji Takayama. She says, hey, can you, like, she explains what's happened, the film that she watched, but she says, hey, can you take my photo with this, with this Polaroid? And he he takes a photo of her face and it's all skewed and warped. So she's been cursed. Also, he's like a professor, right? Yeah, he's a, I don't know of what, but yeah. Who's got like a student assistant, which is kind of a weird character that she like goes into his house and, and, and then she messes with something that he's written on the board, which is kind of a cute little (laughs) Like, absolutely not necessary for the movie, but it's just kind of like a neat little... But her ex-husband watches the movie, and he invites her back inside. And I don't know when you learn that he's a psychic. I don't know if it's, like, right when you meet him. I might have missed that, but... No, I think it's the first real indication is, like, when he's sitting down at that bench, which I don't remember exactly when that happens there, well, but I already or, mentioned that scene. Yeah, like, when he walks into to Reiko's apartment... He kind of stops and he like looks around the room and he lets out like a heavy sigh and uh, you're like, oh, maybe this guy can feel ghosts or something. Oh, okay. That's not how I. Oh, really? Listen, I'm how, I mean, listen, it. OK, re-watch but it. I mean, I, I'm just saying like you're you're watching a movie. You don't see that and you're like, oh, he's a psychic. Like, bam. Like, no, no, no. Like, you, you know, but you're asking like. What's up with upon this guy? A, yeah. Upon a rewatch, you're kind of like, okay, maybe that's something. Maybe a little something's yeah. going on. He gets his uh, ex-wife to make a copy of the video for him so he can like study it at home, I guess. And then the next day... Well, he yeah, he watched it. He does not get a phone call. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't get called for whatever reason. Well, the next day, this is the scene that you were talking about when he's approached by this white-clothed figure while he's sitting on a bench. And it's a great scene because 
he's at like a busy intersection somewhere. He's sitting on a bench writing something down and then everybody just kind of goes silent. Mm-hmm. And you see this <laughs> this pair of feet wearing white shoes and the and the bottom of a white dress walk over and stand right in front of him looking directly at him. And he refuses to look up. Right. And we know that's the figure from the film. Yeah. That, that we also saw in the reflection of the TV, obviously. That that was a great scene. And and you're right. That's probably where you're like, oh, this guy, it, it's, it's like a sixth sense almost. He can see dead people. Or is this person even dead? We don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So later that day, uh, Ryuji and Reiko go to like a video lab after unsuccessfully trying to decipher things. While they're at the video lab, they hear like a weird saying that's kind of like buried in in the tape. And it's frolic in brine, goblins be thine. <laughs> right. Which which they eventually find is like an old, like uh, an Sailors. Isu, something from Isu, but it's like some kind of like phrase that has meaning regionally, I guess, or something. Yeah, well, it's from oshima or oshima okay sure yeah no you're right yeah because uh which which they also find the word eruption has relevance there yeah so like over the course of the next couple days they're working together to find evidence of an eruption of what this phrase means and they find that there was an eruption 40 years ago in um oshima where a local psychic woman had not only predicted the eruption of the volcano but she also threw herself into the volcano killing herself and that woman might be the woman on the tape. They also discovered that... Which which woman? Same... Hair comber or white dress lady? I think they believe it's the hair comber. Yeah, then they also like, trace this saying back to it being like a like a sailor's saying or something from, from this area from Oshima. On Friday, Ryuji calls Reiko. He's like, look, we're going down to Oshima. We're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to save you. And at that point, Reiko has brought her son to her father's place. Mm -hmm. And they're just hanging out. Unfortunately, that night, her son watches the tape for Mm -hmm. what is essentially no reason other than... uh, Curiosity. He's a little stupid kid. Um, Well, he he also says that Tomoko told him to take and watch the tape. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Which I forgot about that. It's it's not Tomoka anymore. It's definitely the 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 demon, Ghost the spirit. Lady. Also, so I just want to point out, you know, this is it's Japan, obviously. <laughs> I'm just saying the kid wouldn't have woken up in the middle of the night if he actually had a bed. If he's not sleeping on the floor, he wouldn't have woken up and watched the tape. I'm just <laughs> you know, the Japanese uh, minimalist furniture coming uh, to bite them in the ass here. So the next day. It's a Saturday. Reiko's got, I think, two days left. Her son has six days left. Ryuji's got three days left. They arrive at an inn in Oshima that are run by relatives of the psychic woman. Yeah. The husband, right? The husband in, like, his... Well, they meet the husband. I I didn't know if that was the husband or just, like, some relation. But, yeah, this old disgruntled man that you're talking about... He has some relation to this woman, and at first he refuses to talk about her, or her daughter, who might be the person in the white dress, but eventually he does spill the beans, because, and he doesn't really, because... No, Ryuji, yeah, like, they, they psychically psychic get abilities. it from him, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like a psychic, psychic link. And we see that the woman was indeed a psychic, and... But she, she was accused been... of being a fraud. Yeah, yeah, she had been picked up by a doctor. And that's when the daughter freaked out and killed someone with just her mind. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it's a great a scene. Involved, it's a really interesting but... scene. Yeah, yeah, because there's, there's a lot about the, the psychiatrist, basically, you know, this doctor guy. He kind of takes advantage of this woman. He finds a woman who's actually psychic, but then kind of, like, exploits her and... You know, you, there's a bit of like a circus act quality. Yeah, and then when people kind of turn against her, he abandons her. She kills herself, and he takes their illegitimate child away. That, was it illegitimate? Was that's she what they said in the movie. But it also okay. ends when they say, "Oh, it might not have been his kid." But that's her, oh yeah yeah no you're right yeah they it's it's implied that the kid is actually the doctor's kid. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. And the kid's name, for short, is Sada, or long, Sadako. Right. 
So it's all fallen into place. But th this is when the puzzle fills itself in here. So again, we have a psychic woman uh, who's made to look like a fraud, even though she wasn't. She threw herself into a volcano. Sadako is the daughter of the woman and the doctor. Presumably. Who has the ability to murder people with, yeah, her mind, with her mind, which is worth dwelling on a bit. Yeah, I feel like we <laughs> brush past that a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and she's crazy. Or is she just misunderstood, you know? Well, it appears that she was murdered and buried under the cabin in Isu because that's where the phone rang. So, which Yeah, that's the only... I... Because the phone didn't ring in the ex-husband's house. Yeah, I guess, I guess I, you know, come to think of it. So the only people who got the phone call, the only people that we know got the phone call were the ones that watched the tape in the cabin, right? Because we hear yeah. about these other girls and, and stuff in school who die, but they, they we only established that they die seven days after they watch the tape. It doesn't necessarily say that they got the phone call. I don't know why. I mean, if I have any gripe about the movie, which I don't really, because I think it's a fantastic movie, but why wouldn't you just make the phone ring everywhere? And, you know, you could still find another way to tie Sadako's resting place to the cabin. In, in right, the yeah, I, yeah. It's it's almost like it's it's kind of the story might have been like reverse engineered and yeah. <laughs> the, the the phone yeah. the phone ringing in this one spot is the clue that draws them to that spot but you could have written the story in a different way i don't know if we have the novelist to blame in the screenplay because i don't think it's really a complaint you're complaining about it because you're a little Coming negative asshole. nancy over here yeah. <laughs> but you know i think it's fine whatever yeah i mean I, I don't have a problem with it i'm just like if there's one thing i would change that's it reiko and uh what's his name again Ryuji head back to Izu. They have a bunch of equipment that they've bought from like a hardware store or whatever. And it's Monday. So now they're really racing against the clock to save Reiko. They bust out some lattice under this cabin and they find the well from the from the video. And as soon as they touch the well, they get like a like a psychic vision of <laughs> this poor girl standing in front of the well looking into it and her doctor father coming up behind her and just cracking her over the back of the head <laughs> and flipping her into the well. And it's pretty brutal, to be honest. But I also laughed a little bit, if I'm, if I'm also honest. So they take the top off of the well and Ryuji says, look, we got to find the body. If we find the body, if we find her resting place, this curse will be lifted. So for hours, they're just hauling water out of the well and it looks like they're not going to make hours, it in time. Yeah, it takes so long. They they have to switch places because they have one person in the well, it's mm -hmm. Ryuji, and then she's pulling on the ropes which is bringing up the buckets after he fills the buckets, but then she's too exhausted to do it so they switch places so she's in there and it's like it goes on forever. But yeah. I, it's it's really exciting. I think the length of the scene really works. Yeah, I agree. Oh, I also really liked how as they're going into the well you can see fingernails stuck into the side of the wall yes so that pretty, the, the, pretty gruesome. she wasn't dead when she was in when she was first put in the well eventually they do find the body reiko finds the body and this is such a fantastic scene it really is she's feeling around in the water it's ticking up close to like 708 707 when she first watched the tape a week ago she finds hair and she just kind of follows the hair and then the then the body of the girl sits itself up mm -hmm. and this is so really disgusting. creepy motions and then and then just the dirtiness of the well yeah and, and that the, the you know i'm listen i have black hair but i'm gonna say the black hair there's something <laughs> disgusting about it in this scene i i don't know yeah, i well, don't know what it's it is long and you know it's like dead, yeah it's so yeah. long yeah and then i'm just you know we've all been in this in the shower and it's like oh someone yeah hair well, like, in the drain and you know it's kind of like that but the, the best part of this scene though is that when the body comes up you can see like the black hair hanging down over the face and you can see like flesh beneath the hair that's like all all uh um water all nasty like yeah yeah and then she goes to pull the hair back and just pulls all the flesh and hair off the skull and then you just have like a goop coming out of the eye sockets of the skull mm-hmm Reiko leans in for a hug. She's like, oh my god, we found you. I'm not hugging this thing. No, I, I, I mean that's the it, It's the point of the movie that you're supposed to <laughs> hug this thing. But I don't know. I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm not. I know. Yeah, and then it's like 710, and she has outlived her curse. So they're like, oh my god, we've lifted the curse. 
two of them get back into their car drive it was at it was at this point i realized like wait a second does no one come out of the tv in this movie I like know, I right? was yeah. I was convinced. I'm like, oh, I guess that's just in the American remake. Okay, all <laughs> yeah. right, the movie's over. Oh, well, exactly. Yeah. So Ryuji drives uh, Reiko back to her apartment in Tokyo, and it's all good. He's going to go back and work on his academic papers, and she's going to go live her life with her son. That's it. The end. But again, classic twist ending. The next day, Sadako comes for Ryuji. She crawl. Uh, uh, it's just like this is the famous scene from the movie, and probably the famous scene from the American version. Also, I I, I don't. Th- I mean, I could be wrong um, because I haven't seen the American version in a while. But I don't think this happens like after the story wraps up in that movie. I think they mix it in more kind yeah, of in I the agree. middle of the movie. Like maybe, but I I'm not sure exactly how that works. Maybe the guy sees the video before Naomi Watts does. I don't know. But, mm-hmm. I could, you know, it could be wrong, but it's well, yeah. amazing. So, yeah, he, he's just sitting there minding his own business, and then the TV comes on with the ring, with the tape on it. Sadako slowly starts walking towards the edge of the screen, the edge of the frame, and then just starts climbing through the television. And I don't know how they did it. I don't know if... They had like quick cuts or if there was other some kind of other uh, uh, video effect in there. But the way she moves is just so terrifying. Yeah. It's kind of like a quick jerk cut movement sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, jerk, every bit as delicious as the chicken. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, poor uh, Ryuji's killed with terror on his face. So Reiko's kind of heartbroken and confused and she's like why did i survive why did he die is my son gonna die and then his spirit kind of shows up on the television and he points towards a bag sitting on her couch in her apartment and she reaches in and realizes oh i i made a copy of this of this movie and she kind of puts two and two together and realizes oh if you're cursed you can get out of the curse and just pass it on by making somebody else watch the cursed film and then they can get out of it by passing it on. Well, so specifically on so by forth. copying it, not just making someone watch it. Specifically, she made a copy. That's what she kind of concludes. That's how she was saved. So this is a pro-piracy movie. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, but at the end... But... You wouldn't steal a car. Like, no, it's going to save your life. Yeah, so co- everybody copy this movie and pass it on. And that's how you'll survive. So in the in the very end of the movie, in the closing scene, she's driving towards her, her father's house. And you can hear her on the phone telling her dad to watch this movie <laughs> pretty <Right>. much <laughs> uh yeah so that's it that's the end patrick how did you like ring i like it quite a bit like i said i would have to see both this and the american version in in quick succession to know for you know definitively which one i like more because i think they are both very good mm-hmm. and this one's certainly good i i pointed out what i think might be some differences between this in the American version, I'm sure there's no psychic shit in there uh, in the American one. I mean, there might be, maybe the mother might have been a psychic, but there's no, like, psychic ex, ex-husband. that the, the, psych, the psychic doesn't, you know, telepathy doesn't help them solve, you know, doesn't help them find clues in, in the American version. Fairly certain of that. But no, it's good. It's, it's really creepy. It's not gory it's not excessively violent in any way or anything but it's still really disturbing which i think is can be hard to do without being incredibly graphic sometimes but you know it it, it, maybe it's easy to be scary without being graphic Mm -hmm. but it's but disturbing is usually uh, there's a there's a different disturbing is a different level and i think this movie pulls up both scary frightening and disturbing yes yeah i think it's good it's effective i think it's a well-acted movie i think hiroyuki tanada has this like compelling kind of intensity about him that i I really enjoy his performance well and also also that the old man he was great too like when he uh, when he gets i also like that that the 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 kid the little the little boy her her son he's got a room with dinosaur stuff all over it right you gotta establish this (laughs) I had the same poster that he had, and he's got the dinosaurs. It's like it's a list of like 
or it's a poster of like different families of dinosaurs and it's got some pictures and it'll list a few under there so there's the um uh i you know i haven't i don't remember anything about dinosaurs i was obsessed with them when i was younger but like it has the tyrannosaurids or whatever the whatever that family <laughs> is called and then there's the tyrannosaurus rex the carcodontosaurus the giganotosaurus like that stuff i had that poster okay <laughs> that's so. pretty cool out of all the japanese movies we've done we've done like an action godzilla. movie godzilla raids again oh yeah okay yeah okay uh, dead or excluding alive godzilla excluding godzilla audition uh yeah the well, street done, fighter exactly yeah so we've done the street fighter audition uh what was the dead or alive the two takashi Miike movies that's right and this one and i like not all of them have a slow burn but this one reminded me a lot of audition because it was kind of like a long slow yeah plodding burn that really had payoff in the end and it was it like and, and it was the exact same payoff as audition it wasn't something that you whoa necessarily whoa, wanted whoa, to happen. whoa 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 hang no what no hold on no listen hear me out <laughs> It was the same kind of payoff as audition. It wasn't something that you wanted to happen, but but it was like this awesome. I was going to say just because there's a creepy Japanese woman doesn't mean it's the same <laughs> payoff. No, okay, no. no, but but it was all building up to like the creepiest, worst thing. I just really like that. I mean, how, how do you beat crawling out of a television? You know, that's just awful. And sawing just off crawling. someone's foot with garrote wire. I think that's yeah. how you beat it. But yeah, I yeah, also, no, this is a, this is a great movie. It's it focuses more on suspense than shock but still delivers some shocking moments as well well and i I also think that's what makes it so good as a horror movie because it focuses on the suspense whereas like a lot of modern horror movies it's it's all about the jump scares yeah i want i want to talk about this because according to wikipedia the wikipedia page for ring ring parentheses film the poster is the worst thing ever yeah, and maybe it's just maybe it's just the Wikipedia like low res image, but the poster just looks like something cheap. I don't know if that's just like a, I don't know. the The movie deserves a better poster than that, but that's neither here nor there. This is cited, I guess, semi frequently as an incredibly influential horror film, not just for because it kind of starts the J horror craze in America, where we get remakes of all these Japanese horror movies. It's funny, The Ring and The Grudge are the only ones anybody remembers, but we were getting those all the time for like 10 or 12 years. Um, movies like One Missed Call, which is a Takashi Miike movie originally. Oh, um, I didn't even know. A movie like Shudder, which that has my favorite Rotten Tomatoes review of all time. I remember when that came out, probably 2009, 2010, there was a review, a quote, on the Rotten Tomatoes page that from someone that just said, I think they, I think the first vowel is supposed to be an I, <laughs> which is great for a movie called Shudder. And that that's specifically about the remake, of course, uh. because maybe the, I, the you know, um, Dark Water, I think, is another Hideo Nakata movie, which I think is pretty well respected. I think that got an American remake as well. And then obviously, like, we have the American remakes of Japanese movies, but overall, we just have a glut of remakes nowadays. Yeah. The, the um the the mist the well actually no the mist not the mist sorry the fog and ghost ship and all this shit from like the early 2000s <laughs> and that's still going on now it uh there's just too much of it but this movie had an audience in america and it had an audience in america prior to it being remade but now i think now that it's been remade a lot of people who like that movie like to go back and see like okay this is the original this is a little bit different you know the same way people watch the british office you have to think of, and I, I think this is a little overstated, but you have to think of what the state of horror was in the in the 1990s, the late 90s, right? Because there's movements in horror and they change. But like in the 80s, slasher movies were huge. And then there were too many of them and there were too many sequels. And then so that kind of died out. And then Scream comes out and slashers are back. And... They were, and it's funny, it's kind of like how I mentioned The Ring and The Grudge are like the only movies that anyone remembers and talks about when they talk about the uh, American remakes of the J-horror movies. I think similarly Scream and maybe a few other movies are like the only movies anyone remembers or talks about from like the 90s slasher movies, but just know that there were a lot of them and most of them were utter garbage. (laughs) <laughs> scream is awesome urban legends okay i know what you did last summer's okay but you know so this movie's 
cited as like a a push towards like making more suspenseful horror movies movies that didn't have a lot of violence and gore and stuff like that and i don't know how accurate that is but that's supposedly one of this movie's influences also i'll say and this is you know again because the american remake is kind of part of this but this movie is not an r-rated film and obviously neither is the american remake the american remake is famously the, like the the one movie people talk about when they talk about like PG-13 horror can be good. They'll always go back to the ring. But that actually, I think you see a dip in quality in mainstream horror at a certain point, I think because they kept just making PG-13 horror movies mm, and most of okay. them suck. And it's more recently, like in the last six or seven years, I think we've kind of gotten away from that. We're making R-rated horror movies again it get out because we we've seen you know the ring was a huge hit and it was a pg-13 horror movie and now we've seen that r-rated horror movies can still be really successful the halloween movies the recent halloween movies like i think we're away from this garbage pg-13 crap and we're making (laughs) r-rated movies again so that's kind of nice but uh this is probably influential for that i'm not going to blame this movie for the shitty pg-13 horror movies we got in the 21st century but you know probably somewhat of an influence okay well that was a good uh that was a good uh early 2000s late 90s uh, yeah i feel like lesson. that was very very rambling um no that was good leave it all in when you're editing this that was good don't tell me what to do bitch okay. <laughs> cut that <laughs> so jim which of these two movies do you prefer and why oh man throwing the and why in there well, I mean, that's what we end up talking about anyways, even if it's not in the question, because obviously I'm not just going to say, oh, I like <laughs> Ring more, and then like, what do you think? And it's like, no, we're going to have some kind of discussion here. I did like Ring more. I just really like, I, I, I don't want to say that like Frankenstein was a little out of date for me, but it to me, The Curse of Frankenstein was, was more of like a something to look back on kind of fondly at this kind of era of cinema and okay. and the hammer horror films the ring was or ring my apologies was way more my speed i loved the suspense of it it i had me on the edge of my seat even though i knew exactly how it was going to end and i just love that kind of i just love that japanese horror i really do okay i think it's just a fantastic movie well i don't I, disagree with what you said about ring but at the same time i'm gonna say i like the curse of frankenstein more and it really boils down to mainly it's peter cushing's performance i mean i do like the gothic look of like anything gothic and it should you know curse of frankenstein's in color it's like one of those it's not an early color movie but it's probably an early movie to kind of depict those types of gothic castle sets and stuff like that in color Mm -hmm. i don't think that that's that's usually associated that with older black and white movies but so that looks awesome but yeah, it's that Peter Cushing performance, man. And I think it could be just, it's easier for me to appreciate acting if it's in my native language and I'm not reading subtitles, obviously. Maybe every actor in Ring is just as good as Peter Cushing is, but the Peter Cushing performance resonates more with me. Not that I relate to the character or anything or <laughs> like the character, but the character is fascinating to watch. He's just a crazy man. And that's sometimes, it's just, all you need you need to like that's why his reanimator is awesome as it is it's because jeffrey combs is a crazy person like yeah the gore (laughs) is fun but the jeffrey combs performance is where that movie's at so jim how do you think this stacks up as a drive-in double feature i personally think it's great i I think it'd be great I, i like how you have that juxtaposition between kind of like classic western horror and wait we didn't watch bone tomahawk (laughs) shut up western cinema hemispherically and 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 you have like this japanese horror cinema that's something so completely different from the curse of frankenstein but it's just so interesting to watch them side by side you know what i mean it's such it's it's just neat seeing that juxtaposition it's it's fun being kind of put off by things like the makeup like the like the practical effects in uh frankenstein and but also really appreciating the acting and then going to ring and appreciating things like the sets, the practical effects with 
the body in the well and everything, and also the acting. I don't know. The, I just I just the television like that. is the is the big effect too. The, the everything. Oh yeah, Sadako actually. Yeah, but um, <laughs> and is as far as you you say the sets, but I'm just gonna say the production value, the product, you know, the the yes, the yeah, that's, prop that's, of the that's tape, better. or you know, I guess it's not a prop; it's part of the film when you're actually watching that. But just the the quality of the um, production of that videotape and making it feel both authentic and alien, you know, yes. I think is something one of that movie's big strengths, as I mentioned. I'm going to say this is a, a very good double feature as well. For me, it, it's it's not... There's no philosophical reason why they're great together. It's just they're both solid movies and they're both horror movies. They're also... they're Neither of them are American, which is just kind of fun. You know, we haven't had that too often. I think maybe, mm-hmm. no, maybe we've never had it. <laughs> both very good movies, both solid. It, it's, it's funny to see The Ring, or I did it again, uh, Ring as this... It's this return to suspenseful horror, again, according to Wikipedia, which I I think that's overstated to a certain extent. But it's not going for shock. It's not going for gore. And yet Curse of Frankenstein, as we were saying, is this... Nowadays, it's a classy, classic, respected horror movie. But in its Mm -hmm. day, it was seen as horribly graphic and shocking. And it was like... It was the saw or hostile of its day. And it's funny... Because it's tame in in today's in the context of today, but it's even it's tame in relation to the ring. You're oh, damn it to ring. <laughs> but I do think both movies are very good, and yeah, they work reasonably well together. I would like to watch both of these movies again. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Jim, would you like to hear about what we're doing next week? Of course, I would, Patrick. <laughs> Well, this this ought to excite you because we are leading off with the 1965 film Thunderball. Oh! Starring the great Sean Connery, a Scottish actor who's a little bit better than the Scottish actor that we saw in The Curse of Frankenstein, of course. The guy (laughs) playing Paul. I'd say more than a little bit better. And then speaking of legendary Hollywood star actors who are actually kind of assholes, we have Charlton Heston in Soylent Green. (laughs) I liked that was a great introduction <laughs> yeah i mean you know the connery beats women charlton heston shoots people and you know i don't know <laughs> so that's that's gonna be a fun one a couple of classic or kind of classic movies there all right so tune in next week for that be sure to check out our patreon patreon.com slash revenge of the drive-in for extended cuts of episodes early releases and exclusive commentaries and tracks from myself and jim also check out our youtube channel which is not particularly exciting it's more just audio versions of these episodes but on youtube with a little it's bit existing. of existing yeah it exists it's out there it's, it's it's in the it's in the ether exactly yeah and follow follow us on twitter at drive in podcast to see what we're up to or rather what i'm up to because jim doesn't do social media so much but yeah Thanks for tuning in this week, and we hope to catch you next time. And thanks for having me, Patrick.